All right, everyone. Well, it's lovely to see um, a bunch of you on Zoom and also a bunch of you here in a room in the science complex. I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. And it's an exciting day in Guelph because it must be about five degrees C here. And uh, last week, the robin, the male robins also appeared. So despite everything, there are signs that spring is coming. <laughs> so let's take a moment just to be grateful for the land we're on and to remember that everywhere in Canada belongs on the traditional territories or unceded lands of indigenous peoples. And here in Guelph, of course, we reside on the um, traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, one of the Inishu Naubek people. Okay, so today um, we're also grateful to be hearing um, uh, another talk on behavioral change. So how can we work with an understanding of people's psychology to inspire change that benefits animals? And our talk today is Dr. Lisa Morgan. Lisa is a veterinarian and she's senior lecturer in animal health and welfare at the Royal Agricultural University in the UK. <laughs> Laura is just tweaking the sound in the room. It's a little bit boomy. Quiet. There we go. Thank you. A bit more subtle now. Um, and she's interested in working with farmers to um, promote uh, better use of antimicrobials, anti both to benefit current animal welfare and also future animal welfare to reduce um, the development of antibiotic resistance. So um, without further ado, I will kick off and hand over to Lisa. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll deal with them. We'll, I'll, I'll, ugh, I can't even speak today. I'll relay them at the end of the talk. Uh, we would have people joining in, but we've had some nasty Zoom bomb experiences, which <laughs> always knock five years off the end of our life. So we're not going to risk today. <laughs> All uh, right, sympathize. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you very much. And um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about inspiring change on farms um, and particularly harnessing the power of peer to peer learning as, a, as an approach, um, a tool in the toolkit. Um, and some of my experiences from my research and working in industry um, uh, with farmers on the topics as wide as antimicrobial stewardship, as Georgia kindly pointed out, but also wider health and welfare um, in livestock farming. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a nice sunny picture, which I think maybe might go down not so well if you are still covered in snow. <laughs> but um, this is where I'm based in um, England, in the Cotswolds, it's called, a very picturesque um, area of England. And that's uh, the Royal Agricultural University there in the middle. Um, and it's been around from sort of mid 1800s uh, and is you know, quite a, a established and well-respected institution when it comes to um, agricultural research and, and all its facets. I'll start with um, just a little bit about um, myself, just so you, um, it sounds very self-indulgent, but I think it helps with um, understanding where I've come from and some of the experiences and, uh, and things I'm going to share with you, you guys. Um, so as George said, I'm senior lecturer in animal health and welfare, but I am very much started out um, as a mixed veterinarian in practice down in a place called Cornwall, some of you might know in the furthest southwest part of England. Um, and that's where I, I kind of had a a sort of baptism of fire, as we call it, but um, in, in agriculture and working with farmers. And I first realised that, you know, being a young lady from a different part of the country coming in and trying to advise farmers about how they should improve the health and welfare of their animals, I just wasn't really getting anywhere. Um, uh, my communication style, no doubt, needed improving. Um, and it made me think, well, why should they listen to me? Like, they've been farming for years and years and years. The families have been farming in those areas for years and years and years. Um, what other ways can I help them, you know, uh, improve their health, herd health planning, flock health planning, um, and augment the um, experiences of animals on farm? And that's when I started uh, dabbling, really, with doing farmer meetings, bringing farmers that, are, you know, live barely a, a mile apart yet barely saw each other uh, bring them together um, to discuss and understand uh, how to improve so that's what I started doing in practice I um, loved that part of it um, probably liked the being on call a little bit less um, and, and sort of 
got lured into research because of that um, at the University of Bristol. And that's where I started my PhD, supervised by David Main, I'm sure many of you know, um, but also Professor Kristen Ryer, who headed up the uh, heads up the AMR force group over there, and a couple of social scientists, Henry Buller and Maria Escobar. And they kind of had, had an enlightenment moment, I suppose, in my PhD. And that's when um, I sort of dived into the social science, sciences and, and qualitative research. And I was speaking to Quinn at the beginning about how, you know, I've been taught that randomized control trials and data, quantitative data was um, the, the way of doing research um, and had my eyes opened to social philosophies um, and philosophy of science, really. Um, so I did my PhD, which I'm going to share a bit of intel from that and what we can learn from that PhD, which is all around um, a participatory pharma-led approach to antimicrobial stewardship um, and understanding what we, we can take away from that with the pharma advisory interactions. And then I moved um, away from academia and into industry where I worked as a facilitator for a knowledge exchange charity called Innovation for Agriculture, which is there on the top left of your screen, um, an independent charity that aims to bridge that science practice gap and bring people together. Um, whether it's farmers to farmers or multi-stakeholder approaches to try and inspire and support change, whether that's around soil health, uh, regenerative farming, animal health and welfare, um, and business resilience, whole whole host of subjects. And um, they're a really cool group. Uh, you can go and look out look out online. And if you're ever in the UK, um, more than welcome to come along to any events that they do. So I was there for a few years and then I've been lured back into research and academia um, and as senior lecturer in animal health and welfare. I'm really keen to see more participatory action research approaches used in, in this context because I think they are really helpful. So let's launch into it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about participatory approaches today, uh, what they are, um, how they can help, um, where they sort of can be applied. Um, and then particularly look at peer-to-peer -peer learning models. So some of the stuff in the literature and, and that's been applied across Europe, but also a little bit back from my PhD. Um, and then hone in on facilitation, uh, the role of facilitators and a little bit about the facilitation skills um, and how that can be a really forceful um, uh, tool in the toolkit for particularly advisors, but lots of different people in the industry uh, to help um, initiate change. What we'd all like to see, I'm sure, is going from a much more reactory and firefighting kind of stance when it comes to uh, animal health and welfare, and maybe the problems of manifested for many, many, many years, maybe, or for a long period of time, and there's not a lot we can do to being much more proactive and empowered, whether that's empowered farmers, empowered advisors, um, uh, and preventative and uh, in, in what we're doing on farms. That's kind of what we hope to see. And I, I genuinely believe uh, and have seen in, in action that participatory approach can help increase engagement of not just farmers, but also vets and advisors. Uh, who have a critical role to play in, in animal welfare, particularly in um, the context I'm I'm from in the UK. Um, but can help with data collection and benchmarking, which are really powerful tools uh, to help reflect on practices. Can lead to more action planning. So moving away from, I mean, in the in the UK, we, we talk quite a lot about herd health and flock health planning. Um, and it can be seen as a bit of a tick box exercise and is not uh, optimised necessarily as a way of um, improving the lives of animals under our care. So going to a more action-based process um, and hopefully leading to improvements in welfare of not just the animals, I might hasten to add, but also the people looking after the animals um, and that human-animal bond. So let's see how this works. Now, change in agriculture is probably the first thing to start with. Um, it's a really interesting subject, actually, when we look at it in the whole. Um, and it does require us to take a bit uh, a look back in time. Now, this might be quite a European centric view, which I apologise for, but it has relevance uh, across the globe. Uh, change in agriculture has been traditionally quite um, top down in Europe, particularly um, after the period of, sort of the 1800s, 1900s, um, where we had things like the Great Famine, we had the World Wars, um, and this you know, devastated the population, it devastated the ability to produce food. And I've got the Women's Land Army on there today because it's uh, yeah, Women's History Month, so I wanted to put about the uh, land girls, as they were called, which was a fully female um, cohort of people that produce food in the UK when um, men were called out in conscription to, to war. 
Um, and after this period, there was a real need to produce food, a lot of food and quickly. And this led to the post-war industrialization period um, uh, and led to, to changes such as mechanization and um, in farming. Uh, and it was wholly appropriate at the time because of the need to feed quickly and researchers, technology providers were given sort of um, quite a lot of power and influence and investment to come up with the solutions that were going to increase the productivity of agriculture uh, at that time. And this was then sort of transferred traditionally by agricultural extension, which you guys might be familiar with because um, st still um, practiced in many parts of the world. And we kind of call it knowledge exchange a bit more here in the UK. But those ideas, those, that's knowledge of those experts, inverted commas, um, is, it was tra transferred in a quite linear way down to the the people that we we perceive to need to adopt them and, and change but we are seeing the sort of downsides or the uh, unintended consequences we might add nowadays with this sort of push on productivity and push on mechanization and more from more and more uh, from uh, land and animals and we're seeing that in terms of biodiversity loss in climate crisis uh, land use issues water quality issues um, and in the last 20 30 years scholars in this sort of area have heavily criticized this model this sort of linear top down and one way of getting change and, and and moving knowledge and expertise uh in farming so this is what it has been like particularly in this sort of uk european centric um perspective linear top down and one way um and there's been lots of calls and examples of moving to a different approach that balances that top down one linear way with a more bottom-up uh collaborative equitable uh, form of, of change and knowledge mobilization, which um, values lots of different expertises, lots of different knowledges, um, uh, and puts the people that are affected by some of these changes, uh, first and foremost, in the change. And I've talked about uh, vets particularly here, because lots of people be like, yeah, totally agree, you can see the value in that. Um, and, you know, and we're not throwing out top down, and we're kind of balancing it using um, a bit of a mixture of both, but trying to um, use more bottom up in very complex issues where sort of people that are being affected by the changes need to be involved. But I found in a um, UK setting, it's been quite hard for vets to pivot to a more um, bottom up approach. Um, and I'm sure this is true for many different groups. Um, vets are traditionally trained to be advisor led and, and quite pedagogical in their way of sharing knowledge um, and advising. And it can be quite a different mindset shift to, to go to a more collegiate um, bottom-up approach where everyone's a bit more equal in the types of knowledge they have. Now I've got a little um, statement on here from a, a, a chap called Gareth Enticott that many of you may have come across. He um, is based in Cardiff in Wales. He's um, a human geographer, but he's done quite a lot of work around um, biosecurity and, and, and tuberculosis in cattle in the UK. So I've got a bit of a problem with that. Um, and I just wanted to read it out here because it's quite a good summing up of um, the ethos of a participatory approach. So without significant structural changes to the social and economic environment to make behavioural changes possible, blaming farmers for not adopting new practices is misguided. Rather, what is required is to involve people in the creation of policies themselves. So they feel part of solutions and perceive them to be fair. And that's kind of getting at the nubbin of, of a participatory approach and using more bottom up ethos um, is involving those that are going to be affected by those those changes instead of having the sort of solutions created elsewhere and and users of those solutions just adopting them. Now, when we talk about participation uh, in this context, I thought it's always good to start with the Einstein ladder, which is a pretty old model, but actually a really good tool to describe the um, kind of spectrum of participation that you can get in different advisory um, strategies or in different communication strategies. So here at the bottom of the ladder, you've got manipulation and education. So this is where there's virtually none or very little participation from stakeholders or, or people involved. Um, and education traditionally has been quite low participation. It kind of is changing across the world. And as you go up the ladder, you get more and more participation to the point where you get to citizen control, um, which is where stakeholders or people involved in the issues and challenges have ideas and solutions that they implement themselves. And they basically set up projects and set up initiatives, which is really quite hard to do um, in some communities where people are very disempowered at, at the start. Um, so a period of 
empowerment uh, can sometimes help achieve this full citizen control. And I would argue with lots of health and welfare issues and livestock farming, um, we need to be at that partnership level, really, at the very least. So farmers and uh, other key stakeholders having direct involvement in that decision making, because they're the ones uh, safeguarding that welfare of those animals and, and caring for those animals. Um, so that's a bit of a visual description. Um, but this, then on the right of my screen, I've just got some sort of key attributes of that participatory approach, which kind of explains why it can sometimes be hard for those who, who have been in a very top down position. So I think it's been quite hard for uh, policymakers here in the UK to take a more bottom up participatory approach, although in DEFRA they are trying. Um, but it's acknowledging and addressing power structures uh, are crucial to a participatory approach and then involving and empowering people um, equally um, and valuing that expertise that people bring and redistributing power in decision making um, so that people affected by those decisions have a stake in the decisions. And it can, it's been shown then again and again of how it, um, if you are having a say in the decision, those decisions that affect you, you're more likely to buy into to changes rather than just being told. Now some examples um, from, for this sort of approach in practice. Um, there's loads out there. I'm kind of giving you very agricultural specific ones uh, in the interest of time. The uh, Henovation was a project that um, was part of Horizon Europe's um, funding stream that ended a few years ago, which tackled welfare issues in the lay and hen sector across Europe um, with groups from in Croatia, in Germany, in England, lots of different sort of innovation groups that were mainly formed of farmers, lay and hen farmers, um, where they identified problems that they were struggling with when it came to looking after their hens and ensuring their welfare. And then together in a very iterative cyclical process, they came up with ideas and plans to improve the, the welfare of hens, putting ideas together um, that could help some of those pinch points or risk factors, um, and then sharing that wider with their, their colleagues and industry. And I put this one up here because it contrasts very much with that top down linear model where external people have come up with the ideas and just transfer it to those that don't get a say in it, whereas this is very much put in. The, the farmers first um, and it's very social as well uh, there's lots of literature that talks about how we are you know clearly social creatures um, and learn in a, a social context we don't learn in a vacuum we know and develop knowledge and generate knowledge based on what we've already learned and based on how we learn with other people um, which is why another reason why these um, uh, processes can be so um, effective Another one that you guys may well have come across is stable schools. So these were based in, uh, in Denmark and kicked off as a sort of research project in the early 2000s, um, where it was groups of organic dairy farmers that came together as part of their, uh, their producer pool, uh, wanting to do something about antibiotic use. They wanted to reduce their antibiotic use. Um, they wanted to do that through improving their animal health and welfare. And they actually identified that their vets were not key stakeholders here they weren't being very helpful which is quite an interesting point um so they came together in peer groups they poured over each other's data they went and visited each other's farms uh and they came up with recommendations for one another about how they could improve and they go through that whole cycle twice um and there's loads of papers on this and the danish government loved it but they basically did manage to reduce things like mastitis uh, in their cows so they didn't have to use as much antibiotic um through this approach compared to those not in the, the approach and the Danish government loved it and ad have adopted it into their obligatory animal health service. So they've got a choice as a farmer. You either take part in these sort of stable schools or you uh, get your vet out more often to help you uh, tackle any kind of uh, health and welfare stu uh, medicine stewardship issues. So that approach, taking a very much uh, participatory, bottom up, peer to peer learning uh, ethos that I adopted for my PhD uh, at the University of Bristol. Uh, I was funded by Industry and Langford Trust, and I kind of adapted it to the UK setting uh, and the UK dairy farming sector. I called it the Fossil Farmer Action Group model. But it was very, very much inspired by stable schools um, and other uh, formats of peer to peer learning. We had 30 dairy farms uh, take part in the project uh, that was split into five different groups. And I followed them around with a dictaphone essentially for about two years, being that sort of annoying research girl. Um, and that was between 2016 and 2018. We had 58 on-farm meetings in total, uh, produced 30 medicine reviews that compared year one with year two, 
30 different action plans that the farmers came up with themselves for their, their group. Um, so each farm had their own specific action plan and I ended up heaps of qualitative data uh, and somehow a PhD at the end of it. <laughs> so any of you PhD students out there, keep going. <laughs> um, this is roughly, just give me a bit of geography, it's really zoomed in, but this is this is Cornwall where I used to work. And this is the rough approximation of where the, um, the groups um, were. Um, and it was a very cyclical process, like that innovation, innovation cycle, this kind of iterative backwards and forwards, uh, social, messy, quite often funders absolutely uh, love the approach because it's so messy, but um, it, it involved regular on-farm meetings to discuss how to reduce the need for antimicrobials. They were kind of um, gathered under that kind of topic and, and goal from the start. So going back to that participatory ladder, this possibly wasn't at citizen uh, control. This was more at the sort of partnership, um, delegated power kind of level. Um, and each meeting, we had a farmer-led farm walk and facilitated discussions to identify positive areas for each farm. You know, really start with the positivities. Uh, and we didn't call them negativities, we call them opportunities for change, uh, which the group would, as a peer group, help recommend to each other. Well, why, have you, why don't you try this? Have you thought about that? Oh, I tried this, this didn't work. And it's that was key. It wasn't me advising them what should go on that action plan or any of the, the other facilitator. It was their peer group. And that was absolutely um, pivotal because that was well-respected experiential knowledge. So very interactive. And these are sort of tools you can use if you, you know, working with farmers or any kind of you know, stakeholder when it comes to animal welfare. Mapping's a classic, you know, great thing used in the charity sector all over the world. Uh, pictures, diagrams, it doesn't always have to be words. You know, clearly you can see smiley faces, or identify opportunities, red points for hotspots for uh, health and welfare that clearly impact antibiotic use. If you've got healthier animals that don't get ill as much, the, the need for using antibiotics is massively reduced. So outputs, um, they had action plans clearly. Each farm had an action plan that was created at that first meeting and then I sort of followed them through with interviews, measuring implementation rates um, and we had those medicine reviews uh, and each farm was uh, benchmarked with the rest of their group and the rest of the farms in the project anonymously and that was a really important starting point actually um benchmarking is becoming more and more common in the uk on farms but nowhere near as well used as it should um and no one was really doing on a common basis medicine reviews uh on these farms this was before what we have we have a thing called red tractor farm assurance here in the uk uh which is 96 percent of dairy farms or something in the uk have to have this sort of auditing process uh to be able to sell their milk so they've introduced this as a as a thing now medicine reviews but it wasn't currently in place at the time. And I started off with basic, you know, how much are you spending on antibiotics? And I went to their vets to get this data. Um, how much are you use, spending on vaccines compared to anti-inflammatory drugs, compared to pain relief, you know? Um, so that was a starting point. And then we started introducing more and more data as a discussion with the group, try to pick apart the metrics, pick apart the benchmarking. So they really, you know, were involved in it and recommended what, how it should be presented and, uh, and things. So although it started out as like, oh, we can do this to measure the impact, it actually turned out to be a tool for engagement and learning for the, for the group. Uh, you can see some of the sort of headline figures on the, the right, but um, at least every farm changed at least one thing. Um, and 83% of the farms had implemented more than a third of their action plan. So implemented, either completely finished, done the thing, great, or we're still implementing it. Um, and what I've got HPCIA on there just to explain that's highest priority, critically important antibiotics, um, which are some, some ones we need to protect for human use. And they were quite widely being used in dairy farming in England at the time. But the 22 out of 24 farms that were using them reduced within a year. Um, and they came up with loads of different actions. The average amount of actions on their plans was about 10, which was loads, I thought. Um, a discussion with their vet was the most implemented action. Uh, although most commonly coming up were things around the environment the cows were kept in, the bedding area, the bedding material, the space, the, the shed space. These were like the most commonly discussed things because farmers really recognised that if they could improve the environment that the cow was in, um, meet her needs, then there was less risk to her health and her welfare and they're therefore less antibiotic use. So yeah, summarise that a little bit. The bits I really got from the quality data, which I'm sure you guys are going to be quite interested in, um, is the mobilisation of knowledge was the first thing that really became um, 
prominent in this approach um, and the facilitators were key in mobilizing that knowledge so it was mobilizing the knowledge between the different farmers between the different systems and approaches so they could learn of one another it was identifying where they had gaps and there was a massive gap about the types of antibiotics that they were they were using they didn't even know what they were using a lot of the time um, so there was a gap identified there that really should have been filled by their own vets um, and we encouraged that to occur um, and then there was also sort of a hesitancy about mobilizing this knowledge and sharing this knowledge from those that sort of didn't want to take part in the project as well which is a really interesting finding and from the vet side of things when I interviewed them they had a real hesitancy uh, about this approach um, you know what if it undid farmer their veterinary advice to farmers from getting farmers together so that's something we can definitely discuss um, and the other thing I found from following these guys through for this period was the increase in their confidence and they were often tackling um, changes that were quite risk laden um, if I do stop doing this if I stop treating an animal is she going to get really ill uh, and then her welfare will be in jeopardy so they wanted this sort of support from one another to and, and to hear from others that had done it and that increased their confidence and they had a huge amount of confidence to go then talk to their vets as well from this process um, so more information can be found in the paper but what I really wanted to highlight um, as an, a, a thing to adopt when trying to stimulate change and support change in agriculture is peer-to-peer -peer learning. No one knows a farm better than the farmer. It's kind of the crux there. Um, and I've tried to distill from my research and from other bits in the literature, uh, the key ingredients of the peer-to-peer -peer learning approach in this context. So first of all, farmer-led. Uh, it's prioritizing and respecting farmer expertise um, and really doing everything in a co-way so like co-creation and co-design co together um, getting farmers to choose who they work with and if you're doing group structures and and then listening rather than leading if you are the sort of scientist or advisor on the uh, outskirts open dialogue um, seems pretty obvious um, <laughs> for those you know do these sort of things but um it's creating that safe non-judgmental space uh encouraging others in the group to share and uh, getting away from it being that sort of top-down knowledge transfer approach to being a much more um collegiate collegiate and collaborative structure um, and then some issues i think uh when I've done, I'll talk about some examples later, but when I've worked on tuberculosis um, in cattle in the UK, ground rules have been actually quite important because it can be quite a hotly contested subject. Experiential common learning. This is something the stable schools really identified as key um, in the peer to peer learning approach in farming. Um, you know, prioritizing farmers learning from one another rather than externals, sharing of that practical knowledge and valuing that. Um, it's not just the randomized control trials, remember. Uh, practical. Again, another obvious one, but I'm always surprised back again back here in the UK. I'd be interested to hear what your experiences are in Canada, but um, getting out and farm and doing these kind of approaches uh, rather than sitting in um, a vet practice or pub. Demonstration of kits and processes, analysis and benchmark of data. Um, I got farmers acting out how they put dry cow therapy in. And they had like competitions to, you know, describe it in a certain amount of time. It's keeping it, keeping it practical action orientated so how, this is how where these kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning action group models differ from a discussion group or many of the discussion groups i've come across um they're not just sort of talking shops under a topic we, we weren't just talking about animal health we were working towards that goal of um reducing reliance on antibiotics and um, it's very outcome based regular and cyclical um this is something i've talked to funders quite a lot about um it can be quite hard when you've got a set amount of time and money that you do these sort of one-off things um and I mean, phd was probably a bit guilty of this but keeping that support uh ongoing out uh, and ideally if you've empowered a community so much um that maybe was disempowered at the start and i can argue a lot of farmers in the food supply chain are quite disempowered um when it comes to food production you you'd hope that they'll be so empowered that they can carry this on this carry this approach this learning this new knowledge on but sometimes it it might need more facilitatory support to reinforce change um and what's really critical with the peer-to-peer -peer learning is that the social support and accountability can keep that that momentum going and the fact that in the farmer action groups the farmers were you know going around each other's farms and they're all going through this same quite critical appraisal process together um kept up that momentum follow-ups kind of similar um you know really 
going back you know it could be week after a um a, a group approach or um after some adv advising going back a year later two years later um that evaluating progress against that and finally the last ingredient um in the sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning model is facilitation and i'm going to sort of hone in on this a little bit more uh, for the last few slides um there's loads of literature about facilitating and there's lots of different styles and um uh processes for facilitating it's kind of a profession it's an art um it's a communication skill and it overlaps with other um communication skills such as like motivational interviewing um but it's also a role um it, it, you know you are coordinating you are keeping discussions on track and on time keeping momentum up but you're also um reflecting and, and brokering knowledge and, and referring back to groups collective knowledge and building their uh, confidence and expertise up so there's quite a lot going on in facilitation um i'm gonna i don't have time to really talk about all the little communication skills but i've got some handy hand handouts handy handouts that i can share with you um that were designed more for vet audience but i think could be quite useful um one of the if I had to distill like a facilitator's key skill, um, which there are many into one, I always talk about questions, um, which particularly with a vet audience, it helps when you think, oh, but I'm here to advise. I'm like, well, you can ask questions. <laughs> um, and this little quote, I think, is quite appropriate to the farm animal setting. Um, a question is a midwife that brings ideas to birth. That was Socrates many, many years ago. Um, and it is that kind of helping people reflect on on their own positionality their own practices and um sparking that those ideas of change because when it comes from an individual they're more likely to see it through so here's some definitions of what facilitators are um or facilitators do um and again i refer i kind of relate this back to animal health and welfare because if you think about facilitation is the art of leading people through processes towards agreed upon objectives in a manner that encourages participation, ownership and creativity by all those involved. I mean, that's great if we can do that in herd and flock health planning. Um, so, I, you know, I think this suits facilitation down to a T. Uh, helping people engage in, manage and cope creatively with the rapid changes within themselves, their communities and the globe. Um, again, I'm talking about UK and Europe. We've, we've divorced ourselves from the European Union and we're having political upheaval and changing agricultural support I mean it's turbulent out there for farmers in the UK at the moment so I, the need for facilitators um, to help people work together support each other and adapt to change is ever more important um, and in sort of advisory capacity there's lots of opportunities where we can use more facilitation skills so having that um, more listening active listening mode asking those th those open questions bringing in the collective experience and expertise of groups um, at routine herd and flock health visits you can use it in one-to-ones as well because like I say it overlaps a lot of these communication skills with motivational interviewing but then holding farmer meetings that aren't just um, you know deaf by powerpoint but um, stimulating discussion, um, listening rather than leading. Um, and I actually think in the workplace, when I've done policy workshops talking about the value of facilitation, interestingly, policymakers have come back rather than trying to fund these things and institutionalize them, they've been like, oh, I might use facilitation more with my work colleagues. I'm like, I'll see that as a result. <laughs> Um, and finally, wrapping up with some other practical examples that might give you some ideas, particularly if you guys are thinking about um, particular welfare issues you want to uh, tackle and how what approaches you could um, use and maybe write into applications. Um, this one's from another European project called Disarm, Disseminating Innovative Solutions for Antibiotic Resistance Management. They all have horrendously not catchy titles. Um, and there's a website you can go check out if you just type Disarm EU, and they've got loads of free resources on there. Um, but we were one element of this uh, very cross-country, cross-livestock species project was setting up and understanding how multi-actor farm health teams work. Um, and you could easily do this as a farm welfare team approach, um, not just focusing on health. And it was critically bringing together all the farm staff. Um, and that in itself is a very valuable thing that doesn't happen near as enough as it should in many places. Um, so it would be interesting to see how, you know, frequent this occurs in Canada and this is owners of farms workers on farms family farms you know bringing everyone together in that protected time and space once a year maybe twice a year to reflect on how the farm and animals have been performing and 
how uh, changes could be implemented into the future. We're also bringing in the vets and the techs, the nutritionists, feed reps, consultants and advisors of all types. And in some places we saw the bank managers being re used really effectively um, because it's all well and good a vet saying knock down that shed, build another one, otherwise you're gonna, your calves aren't going to cope. If you in tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds of debt, uh, that's just not going to happen uh, without some bank manager involvement. Um, and it's quite a straightforward process. It's reflecting, using data, determining your goals as a group, bringing everybody's expertise. Because you imagine if you have all those people together in one space, that's a wealth of experience and knowledge to help uh, bolster a, a farm and improve uh, health and welfare. And then going through this cyclical process, reflecting back on changes uh, and keeping going. And these are just a few other examples of when we've brought such diverse stakeholders together, because I've done quite a lot around farmer peer to peer learning and sort of delved into well, actually broaden that stakeholder group. You bring in people from diverse backgrounds, diverse um, agendas and, and uh, roles. Uh, and that's where the magic happens, I think. And we've used it with um, Welsh government funded projects around TB, which is a really contentious issue um, to try and bring all that different expertise together. So you get practical change on the ground. The immersion centre is a really good model, and we've got one that's actually focusing on trying to help farmers um, it, and intervene with support and help before welfare um, compliance becomes an issue and before things like trade and standards get involved, um, or where there's serious welfare issues. Um, and this is going back to that participatory ladder, which is trying to start much higher up, bringing people together who have their own um, challenges that they want to work on and together they come up with a challenge they want to solve, set their goals, set the way they work and own interact on an ongoing basis. Um, and the final one, which again goes back to um, particularly around welfare, is a positive sheep welfare and wool uh, project, which lasted three years on a bit of a shoestring budget. <laughs> um, but it was a participatory project that aimed to add value to wool, which is so undervalued in the UK and Europe. Again, I'd like to be keen to hear your perspectives in, in Canada and North America, but um, so poorly valued uh, in the sector. And it has such um, potential as a fibre, as a green green credentials. Um, and we wanted to add value to that all through demonstration and promotion of the positive welfare standards of sheep from farms in the, the group. So it's a bit of a community of practice. Um, now we had several on farm workshops and online workshops and farmers created this framework that essentially demonstrated all these different positive welfare opportunities that they were providing for sheep under their care. Um, and they talked about putting it into tiers and how they could promote it, how they could be assessed against it. And, and there was loads of um, great ideas coming forward from this and it still really isn't finished this project. But we found we couldn't really add value to wool. We need wider industry engagement. We're talking about whole global supply chain that we were trying to change with about 12 of us. Um, but it really did um, bring together such a group of um, enthusiasts when it came to wool that they formed li sort of lifelong relationships, hopefully, that they're still communicating about um, and gave them ideas about how to improve wool on their own farm. Um, and also how to augment the positive welfare uh, concept. And they really believe that having an environmental element, a farm setting element in that positive welfare was um, absolutely key. So in summary, because I feel like I've been talking for too long, um, <laughs> I've, I really encourage uh, researchers, advisors, farming industry to all take a participatory approach when it comes to uh, changing tricky uh, human-centered human centered problems um, bring in everybody who's got a stake in those challenges and solutions together in an equitable approach adopting peer-to-peer -peer learning models uh, with farmers um, and widen that to sort of multi-actor farm welfare teams I think that could be a really cool uh, thing that I'd love to see people run with um, and upskilling, uh, particularly I've talked in the context of veterinarians and advisors in facilitation, but we're seeing more and more here in the UK, farmers making really good facilitators um, and really takes that ethos of um, citizen uh, empowerment to the next level. Uh, so that will be my summary. I'm really keen to have, hear from you guys. Any questions, emails on there as well. Happy to talk afterwards or now. So thank you.